All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, welcome to the MEC Lunch and Learn session. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, drill and blast, uh, continuous improvement, and really reflecting on some of those fundamentals. Uh, we're excited to present today our very own drill and blast engineer, Mark Killip. Um, Mark has been in the industry for over 20 years and has over 20 years of experience in drill and blast. He originally started out as a seismic blasting engineer, moving into quarrying and construction blasting with Orica, and then also started out in the operations space in the ground crew, um, operating mobile manufacturing units such as bomb trucks and shot firing. He then went as a consultant for gold and coal projects before working as a mine planning engineer for three years in copper. Uh, Mark started at MEC Mining in 2019 and has been an amazing asset to the business. He's worked on many various uh, projects and, and client projects with gold, diamond and coal, both here in Australia and also internationally. Uh, he's got some great experience in open cut resourcing, hard rock growing, limestone, copper, gold, magnesium, manganese, and coal. I'd really love to um, hand things over to Mark today and uh, hopefully you enjoy today's session and get a lot out of finding about the fundamentals for continuous um, improvement in the drill and blast space. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for the welcome. Um, welcome to all those who have attended our session today. Um, hopefully you can get something out of what I'm presenting. Um, it's always a tricky thing trying to find something the industry is going to that's going to add value to everybody um, while also be easy to present in a, in a short session. Um, so yeah, I'll um, I'll get started. Um, I know everyone's time is quite valuable, and um, I've got quite a lot to um, to try and get through to be able to um, show you what we're chasing here. So let me share that screen. Let's check in for someone to put a comment in there. Everyone can see that um, continuous improvement screen up there. I assume so. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to go over today um, one of the fundamentals uh, for drill and blast, um, which I've found on a lot of sites, which is a, a process um, for doing the fundamentals of continuous improvement. Uh, it's a lot of the sites I've worked at around around the country and, and internationally. Um, there's common common themes we quite often see between different sites. Um, some people do things really well. Some people have got some gaps. Some of the gaps are quite large. A lot of the issues that I've seen on sites as regards to a process that you can have that can build continuous improvement and allow you to, to get those gains over time, especially when you're getting changes in, in the rock mass and changes in personnel and changes in system and changes in your um, in the providers that you've got on site. Um, so what, what do I call continuous improvement in blasting? Uh, for me, it's a, a cyclic process, it's an improvement and it's through cyclic cha incremental change. So it's a result of um, reviewing your blast results, identifying the improvements that you can make and realizing those improvements through changing in blast design, executing those practices, and then validating those changes that have actually occurred, um, embedding that improvement into your systems. So for it to work effectively, it's it's usually incremental. Like you want to make relatively small changes, make sure those changes are effective, uh, and moving in the right direction, and then continue them. Um, and if you have made an incremental change and it hasn't worked, um, the negative results are normally minor. So the other I think you can gain from incremental change as well is that you're minimizing waste. So if you have a problem and you make really large changes um, drastically, um, you can step backwards quite substantially as far as the cost and the wastage. So you may have fixed the issue you're having with the blasting, but by doing so, you may have also um, made the entire project less profitable. Um, examples could be maybe you've got issues with the wall control and your pre-split. So the knee-jerk reaction might be to tighten the pre-split um, pattern, bring the wall, uh, the production holes closer to your pre-split, uh, increase the powder factor of the pre-split, for example. If you do all of those things at once, um, you don't necessarily know which one of those actually fix the problem. Yes, you've got to fix, you fix the wall, the wall is great, but it can be quite complex to then start peeling that back. And there'll be a lot of resistance to peeling that back because you don't want to start damaging the wall. Uh, if you can make an incremental change and, and tighten things over a couple of blasts or even the same blast, but over a length of that blast, um, you allow to learn more um, and the continuous improvement going forwards can be quite substantial. Uh, a lot of sites that I go to aren't learning from their mistakes and generally it's one of two reasons. One of them is there's a fundamental issue with the understanding of what's causing the blast issues, um, often from a lack of data, that could be for lack of personal experience. Uh, and the other one is there's no process in place to actually ensure those learnings are captured and are known in the future. So you, you may, some sites have found issues, they've identified them, improved them, and they've done some really, really good stuff to fix those issues. 
And then two years later, the person who understood it all has left. The person after them didn't quite have complete training and the person after those them then goes and repeats the same mistake the cause of problems in the first place. So those learnings don't continue and they're not embedded into the site. Um, the other one I've often noticed as well is, is the gaps between the operational teams and the technical teams. So you might have some very skilled operational teams and shot firers and surveyors um, uh, and some low skill in the engineering team or vice versa. Or you've got good skill in both, but there's some fundamental issues with the KPIs and the deliverables and the way those teams communicate uh, that leads to your drill and blast results being um, non-optimal. So the process that I'm wanting to discuss today is, is one of the processes. There's multiple ways of doing this. None of them are necessarily right or wrong. But this is just an option that I look at that I've seen works reasonably well on site and is reasonably easy to implement. And the basics of it are is, is, is a cyclic process. And so I call it building a baseline, identifying the problem, proposing solutions, implementing those solutions, validating your solutions, and then updating your baseline. So going into a bit more detail on those, um, what I call your baseline is a collection of relevant blast domains. So it's the detailed, highly functional, evolving uh, base points of what forms a blast design, at least to a, a start point. The next point is to identify the problems. So this is your post-blast review reconciliation process and understanding the results. So you can identify where those improvement opportunities are. The next one will be proposing your solutions. So this is um, through some sort of pre-design process. Um, some sites will do something like a blast concept, which is quite effective. Um, and then going through a peer review process before you then turn that into a complex design. You'll then implement them. That'll be your blast design, which is where your drill and blast engineers ideally will be focusing most of their time. And then you want to validate that solution. So make sure that after you've fired it, you're doing the uh, post-blast review and reconciliation and understanding whether or not it worked or didn't work and, and what you can do in the future. Once you've gone through that process, you can then update the baseline. You might be updating it saying, whatever you do, don't do this. Or you might be updating with, this worked. We did this for these reasons. This was the improvements we had. And because of that, this is the new baseline that we're going to use going forward so you can then build and improve. Uh, and that helps you get that continuous improvement process. There may be something as simple as changing slightly on timing, or it might be some fundamental changes in the way that you fire it with the explosive energy the um, direction of movement, it might be the type of explosive you use, it might be the whole diameter, uh, depending on what you've identified as being the issue. So building a baseline, I'll go into a bit more detail um, in the process in each step. So I call the baseline blast domains. Um, you might know them as site data sheets, blast standards, a blast Bible, blast parameters, there's various names, they all end up being fundamentally the same sort of thing. So for me, a blast domain is a way to detail how blasts need to be designed for each different area of your mine. So they divide, they drive the fundamental design decisions. They don't necessarily make them for you, but they at least give you a really good start point to an understanding of what has and hasn't worked in the past and what should be your, your point that you're going to start to start the design crown process. A blast may cover multiple domains. It might cover one. And how complex those domains are is going to be very dependent on what your site actually is. You might have a very, very complex steeply dipping coal mine. You might have a relatively consistent um, volcanic uh, iron ore mine. You might have a mixture of, you might have mixtures of ore and waste. So the level of complexity you're gonna have on your site is gonna be very, very dependent on how many domains you're gonna need and how complex those blast domains will be. So how do they help? They give you the baseline, as I mentioned, for the future blast. They allow you to have a good start point and they allow a sort of, a line in the sand for that where that continuous improvement is going to start. They also substantially improve your design efficiency because you've got, you're not starting from scratch every time. When new people start, they understand what your values are going to be. You shouldn't have big kickbacks because your scheduling should start being more consistent. Um, you can start also, once you've got them and they work, you can then start bringing them into your scheduling software because you start being able to get some fairly good validated uh, processes in place for exactly what an example burden and spacing might be for a certain bench height. You can run formula driven inputs into um, programs like Spry uh, and get some fairly good outputs in relation to your accuracy. So how do you build them? Um, for me, I normally divide the mine up into the areas that have got similar uh, blast abilities. So that might be um, similar rock types. It might be similar bench heights. It might be a certain seam in a coal mine. It might be a certain type of rock mass. Um, it depends on, on how your mine site's set up and, and what your variations are in your blasting. And most of the time it's going to be heavily dependent on geology and geotech. Uh, a lot of the time they line up quite well with geotech domains and may need to be then further subdivided. Um, that part of it is going to involve um, fairly high level of site experience, but generally 
people on site have a reasonably understanding of of where things vary. And even if you start at a high level and then increase detail over time, um, you can improve things that way. Figure out what makes different areas of your mind unique from a licensing point of view and use that to name the domains. Try and have a consistent naming convention that can make things a bit easier, especially as things get more complex over a period of time. Um, use the knowledge the site has for each of the domains. Build up what an ideal blast would look like. So use the knowledge from everyone on site, operations, previous blast results, technical people, people that have moved on into different roles but might have site experience. Get as much input as you can. Even if it's finding out what they did that didn't go well, at least you can put that into your domains and put it into the background information so that people understand what didn't work in the past so they can make sure they don't repeat the same mistakes and understand any sort of process that's gone through previously to understand where the improvements have been made and what direction worked and what directions didn't. Um, as far as the complexity, sometimes they're easy, as I mentioned, sometimes they're highly, highly complex. It depends on what you need on site and also the level of skill and understanding of your site personnel. It's something that should slowly build in complexity over time as you get a higher and higher understanding of your rock mass. And also it's, it's driven by the level of detail you have in your inputs. If you have a really, really good geological model and highly skilled geologist who can give you really, really good detail on that, um, you've got core modeling, core, dra core drill data and, and um, seismic and, and lithology information and a lot of inf uh, background historical data, you might be able to have quite complex and, and really well-defined domains. Um, other sites might have two or three and they're quite loose. I've been on sites with 150 domains um, that were still not that detailed, um, but were required because of the complexities on that mine site and the size of that mine site. Um, some general comments. Um, I personally don't normally put burden spacing in a blast domain. I generally find it's an output more than an input, but that's very much dependent on how your rock performs. There's certainly an argument for having it, especially if you've got consistent bench heights. A lot of the sites I've been working out in the last few years have had high, a lot of um, variation in the bench heights. So because of that, the burden and spacing has been a, an output rather than an input. Uh, but there's, there's certainly arguments in both directions, but it's not I, I'm hesitant when I see sites immediately use a set burden and spacing unless there's a really good driver for it. And sometimes there is. Um, I like, I'd prefer to set the domains up to be a base point rather than a final result to make sure that the engineers are uh, using GI design creativity and a really clear understanding of looking at the complexities of the individual blast rather than trying to cookie cutter um, their designs, unless it's a very, very consistent all body, which is relatively unusual. Um, the other one I'd have for this one is try not to make the actual way you've got your domains too complex. Um, the example I've got on the screen is, is a relatively simple Excel spread, spreadsheet table format, which seems to work quite well for the majority of sites. Um, if you don't have too many domains, I usually subdivide that up into a detailed, um, a detailed page for each of those domains to give additional information. But it depends on, on the level of complexity on your site. Sometimes it's fine to have a single line Sometimes you may need multiple pages of information to capture what's happened in the past. I'd just be hesitant with really complex VBA enabled um, documents. They work really, really well, but just remember that the people in the future need to use it and make sure it's something that's um, able to be used uh, functionally by someone who doesn't understand the coding. So blast domains and what you should include. I've mentioned these a little bit previously. It's very much depend on the site. I personally make sure there's always comments and learnings Generally, powder factor is usually pretty important and certainly one of the drivers or one of the major um, outcomes. It's certainly very reflective for your budget side. Um, whole diameter, whether you've got subdual or standoff and how much, um, your stemming heights, your burden and spacings, your burden, sorry, burden and spacing ratios. Um, as I mentioned, you may be able to use your burden and spacings, but it depends on your site. Uh, what bench heights your domain is valid for, um, what face burden you should be using if you've got free faces. Um, your wall standoffs, if you've got pre-split, your wall standoffs, you've got wall control, um, what sort of loading you're doing, the densities, the decks, um, how you're doing it, your initiation, how you're going to time it, what direction you fire it at, burden relief, angle of initiation, things like that. Um, and also uh, additional information that might be relevant, such as crash protection, if you've got benches underneath the current blasting horizons. Anything that's going to change between your blast and it's not fixed on a mine site, and I would definitely have in your blast domains. It's... I. I'm usually not concerned about increasing complexity too much. It's the more information that's in there often the better, um, but you also wanna make sure they're usable and functional. The next step in the process for me is to identify the problem. So I do this through the post-blast review process. Uh, this is um, done in two steps, and that's normally as a post-blast review immediately after firing the blast, and then further on later, it's a, um, it's a, it's a detailed reconciliation once you've got big data. 
Most PERT sites lack a robust process to update and improve their blast domains. And partly because of that is the, the, there's so much focus on getting the blast designs out because of the timing and the turnover and, and staff numbers and drill prep and all the other inputs that come into making life complex. We don't often have time to review the blast in the detail that need to be reviewed. So you want to try and find a process that allows you to do it effectively and quickly. Uh, what's I've found work quite well on some sites is to have weekly meetings with the operational team. Doesn't necessarily have to take long, but make sure at the very least you've got a video. And if you've got uh, a blast uh, management system like Blast Logic, Blast IQ, Data Blast, something like that, you can generally pull it up and you can get a lot of information very quickly to look at it, what happened, what worked, what didn't. You want your data to be highly accessible, really easy to communicate and add value. Um, this is an example on the screen of a post-blast um, review dashboard that I built for a client with a client recently. Um, it was based in Power BI and looks at the background information that sits in Blast Logic, uh, and it was highly effective to be able to really quickly and easily review Blast information: what happened, how it was blasted, how it was loaded, how many short holes were there, what was the loading compliance, what was the drilling compliance, what percentage of wet walls and wet and wet ground was there. The more information you can quickly gather, the easier it is to understand what potentially caused issues. We went through a lot of detail in the post blast stage where you've only really got a video and how it loaded. Uh, but the reason we do it at that stage is to make sure we're capturing everything operationally. So how exactly did it drill? What caused the issues? How did it load? What caused the issues? What needs to happen differently in order to have a robust and high quality design and ensure that the communication between the design team and the operational execution team is, is effective and, and is you're actually delivering what you need to. I would store any learnings in a blast management system if you have it. Um, I've seen some really good looking um, post blast review uh, documents in Excel and Word and things like that. My only concern with those sort of documents is you need it to make sure that you can still find them in two or three or four years time. Um, those documents can be great, but they're often reasonably large. They link to lots of documents, they break easily. And then uh, if you're trying to find them, they're quite cumbersome. Um, if you are able to get the learnings from that, whether you whether you save them in your blast domains or ideally you save them in something like a blast management system, I find comments in in blast logic and and um, and systems like that work really really well to store that data. It allows you to look it up as a database. So here's some more slides from that. Um, example um, post blast review when I had gives you backfill um, depth it gives you examples of um, of when they drilled it when they loaded it what sort of product you loaded where you loaded that product um, the more information you can pull in there easily the better um, and these those blast management systems are very very effective at presenting that data well if you've got some sort of um, interface uh, this example was um, power bi um, blast iq has its own inbuilt one um, it's a little bit less flexible but it is quite effective uh, there's some good stuff on the market at the moment. I think um, Oblast, OP Blast has got some new stuff coming out as well. The other one that I prefer to have is a checklist. Um, I find them quite effective um, personally. Uh, depends on what you work well on with on site. But um, if you've got the, those checklists, it helps you go through and make sure you've got a systematic process that you're going through and you're, you're triggering the conversations you need to have with the shot fires, the conversations you need to have with the drillers and make sure you're not missing stuff. How much flora could we get? Where did it go? What happened? Part of that will be having good consistent metrics. So for me, I like having really high quality video. I think it's extremely important and something that's often overlooked. A lot of sites will get a drone, but not necessarily look at how functional and effective that drone is for videoing blasts. A lot of the time they're purchased as a um, survey instrument and they may not necessarily be effective um, for blast video. If you can get a lot of the time, the cheaper camera specific drones like your Mavic 2, Mavic 3 Pros can be more effective than some of those 50, $60,000 survey drones because the cameras can be set up more effectively and people are a little more happy to fly them to where they need to be actually sitting to video the blast. So they're not three kilometers away and the blast is this little tiny thing on the screen. You wanna have really good video and also high frame rates. If your high frame rates are high, ideally um, at least 1080K video, really high frame rates. Um, you can slow those videos down and really understand what's causing issues if you've got them. The other one is consistent language. Um, I quite like the um, blast metric from um, the blast violence factor, blast violence factor from Precision Blasting Services. Um, you can find that on their website. Um, it's just a nice prescriptive um, way of describing where you're getting stemming ejection. 
The other one that is quite good is if you can get any sort of fragmentation analysis. Uh, there's a lot of tools in the market now. Some of them are really easy, like the motion metrics handheld um, tablets, got two cameras on it. You can literally walk up and take a picture. Um, Map Tech Point Studio, we've got a tool now that you can analyze your um, scan data from your surveys, or they've got their petrophotogrammetry data. Oracle's got their um, frag track through their Blast IQ system. You've got Split Desktop, uh, which Hexagon Mining now own. There's a lot of really, really good systems out there that allow you to capture that fragmentation data. And if you are capturing it, also understand what you're trying to achieve. If you're um, looking at coal and you're just looking at overburden movement, you only mostly care about how efficient it is to mine. But if you're talking about a hard rock mine uh, where you're looking at an ore, then understand that mine to mill and understand what those fragmentation curves are going to look like downstream and what those effects are going to have on the processing plant. Small changes in your blasting and, and the way you fragment that rock can potentially have huge value changes downstream. Uh, the other one is looking at um, post-blast fume, certainly a large issue um, east coast in Australia when you're looking at your coal mines in that soft um, tertiary ground. There's a lot of problems with the reporting of fume. Um, there's a lot of drivers to under-report, like the amount of times I've heard class 4C fume and the shot fires come in and say, oh, it's an angry two. It's like, yeah, okay. It's... I can understand the angry report, the under-reporting, but it's, um, it can certainly become an issue when you're trying to justify um, spending money and resourcing on fixing the issues. You look back through the reports and it's like, oh, we haven't got a problem with fume here. They're all class two, class one. It's like, yeah, it's not what the videos are showing us. Um, and often it doesn't become a problem until it crosses the boundary and, and suddenly you have very large, very expensive knee-jerk reactions. So getting on top of that stuff early um, can sometimes save a lot of money long-term, especially if you can understand the underlying cause. So um, for fume, I certainly recommend the um, AEISG fume code, which is available online. Um, it gives you an accurate metric for your one to five fume classes and also your um, ABC ranges for your um, where that fume is actually going. Um, where you've got access to instantaneous degrades, try and use that data if you possibly can. You've got MROC, Pegasus, and quite a few other systems that allow you to capture and extract that data. Um, some of the blast management systems are able to report that as heat maps. It's highly effective if you can use it. It really clearly identifies where you're having issues in your blasting, at what depth you're having issues in the blasting, and helps you identify where you can improve them. Um, some of the, pretty much every site has some level of dig rate data, but a lot of the time it's um, reported based on overall blocks or overall um, blasts, um, and it's usually agglomerated with delays caused by trucking. Uh, and things like that. So if that data is still helpful, but the instantaneous dig rate is certainly a lot more usable because it's not delayed, it's not um, diluted with all the other variables that come into a full haulage network. The smaller the parcel of information you can get, the better. If you can get information from single buckets, great. Uh, but whatever you've got, you've got. Um, it all helps to be able to understand what's happened with the blast. Uh, the other one is. Um, where you don't have access to your hard data, um, or if you, if you do have it, is to get some really good quality feedback from the operational teams. The better relationship you can form with those teams, the better a lot of the time for getting it. You'll get less abuse and your name spray painted on large rocks and, and more valuable um, feedback you can actually act, you can actually action. If you understand where those rocks are and how they're, how they're digging and can you get the teeth into the cracks? Is it just hard digging? Is it tight digging? Getting common language on that stuff can be really effective. Um, I just quickly made up a, a a little chart sort of giving some examples on on some of the language I prefer to use with some of the operational teams um, for what you call tight and what you call loose and, and and what hard digging actually is. Is it good? Is it broken? What what is a face? What's a back wall? If you can some of that but those basics can um if you can communicate that to the operator level, uh, they can start feeding back some information that's a lot more usable than just oh it's great or it's terrible or it's horrible. A lot of the time it's hard dig or it's unblasted. If you actually go there and look at it it can potentially be fragmented really well, but it has, the rock hasn't rotated, it's locked in and it's hard to dig. It is actually blasted, but you just need to change the way it's being blasted in order to, uh, to liberate that rock for digging. Once a blast has been mined, at this point, you want to do a full reconciliation. So at that point, you are going to have some level of dig data. And at that point, I do a second pass on my post-blast review. So the first pass should be quite short. It's normally less than 20 minutes per blast, depending on the complexity. Um, the reconciliation side, depending on whether you've got um, engineers that are doing a review for you on the dig side, um, should, shouldn't also take too long. The whole process ideally should take less than an hour per blast. These blasts could easily be worth uh, millions to tens of millions of dollars worth of value. So it's certainly worth spending the time on them where you can. 
sites that are turning over a shot a day, well, obviously at that point, it starts becoming a little bit harder. Um, there may be an argument for combining some multiple blasts together for the reviews. It depends on what you can operationally do. But the more you can review the blasts and the more information you can gather from those, the easier it normally is to make good decisions going forward to improve those, that, those blasts and make sure you capture that information well. The next process is to propose your solutions. You've identified the issues. Um, you now need to try and solve them. So for this, I normally do this in, a, po in a, a process before I do detailed design. On larger sites, this is easier. You've normally got the people to do it on a small mine site when you're the only engineer. A lot of the time, you'll end up incorporating this as part of your design. Um, and you might have a brief discussion with um, stakeholders beforehand. But this is where I would use something like a blast concept. So you're getting your high level design decisions, you're peer reviewing them, you're pulling the things that you're pulling in geology and your geotech and your bench heights and your firing directions, you're looking at your water and how much it is, what are the load rates, is there slumping, is there hot and reactive ground, any loading comments from previous blasts, every single bit of learning that you can possibly get to understand what happened previously, what did you identify as the issue and how are we going to fix it. If you don't know how to fix it yourself, reach out to your um, to whoever you can. That might be a consultant, it might be more experienced peers, it might be people that used to work in the business that have moved on to different roles, um, or it might be your explosive suppliers. They've often got um, some highly skilled, very specialised engineers working for them that can assist or reach out to us. At that point, you can, you can review, um, you can understand what's happening and you can then put forward some proposals for how you're going to fix it. Don't underestimate that peer review process. Um, even if it is with shot fires, the, your level of of understand, their level of understanding of design may be relatively low, it may be really high, um, but having some additional feedback for how it's actually getting loaded can be highly effective and can get rid of some of the issues early on. Um, peer review process, I quite like, as I just mentioned, um, I think that should be, if you're doing it, I prefer the engineers who are doing the designs to always be in the room, drill and bar supervisors, shot fires, drillers, mining supervisors, um, truck and travel engineers, blast schedulers, if you're going to make significant impacts to the schedule, um, take their feedback, learn from it and stick it in your updated design um, where you possibly can. This may just be a concept based on an entire strip. It may be a concept based on an entire bench, an entire segment of the mine. At least you've got some high level of input before you get to the detailed stuff to hopefully identify what's going to happen and clearly communicate what you're planning on doing next. So at least if you're showing that you're solving the, solving, solving the problems, um, you're more likely to get helpful um, support from the teams that are out in the field and working in the rock um, to give you feedback on what is and isn't working before it becomes a larger issue. Next stage is implementing those solutions. So if you've identified them, you've got a base point, you've done your blast concept at high level, and now you're looking at doing your detailed blast design. And this is where I prefer to spend the majority of the time as, as the, a general general blast engineer, where the concept stage is where I'd spend more time as a senior. Obviously on a small site, you end up being both. Um, so the, the blast concept and the designs will often overlap. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you wanna try and get a higher level um, peer review discussion where you can. So the drill pattern design, make sure your engineer knows the job, make sure they've got the tools to succeed things like those um, post blast reconciliation um, dashboards that I mentioned earlier or something similar. Anything you can do to make the process of designing, the process of finding the information quick and efficient is gonna really add value. Ensure that your process for having drill prep available, things like that, all those, those small inputs can make a massive difference to how high quality that design outcome is and to make sure your engineers have got enough time to do their job properly. The amount of times I've been on mine sites where you get a drill prep at five o'clock in the afternoon and the drill crew's parked up and they're about to go on night shift and it's a Friday afternoon, the engineer's meant to fly home. They're working on their laptop at the airport or whatever, trying to get a design out. The likelihood of that design being high quality and really well executed is quite poor. You have problems with hole naming, you have issues because they've made a mistake on standoff distances, they've forgotten to put the crest protection in. Like there's all those issues that will come up because of the, of the rushing where you can uh, put controls in place for that stuff. It's, it's highly effective. It's also most of the time where I see face burst issues because spending the time on looking at those face hole profiles, um, which you can see in here as an example from, um, from Vulcan on the top right of the screen, um, spending the time on looking at that stuff, it, it's, it's a large time investment, but the likelihood of getting good results is quite high if you can use it. Um, I also would always recommend using checklists for your engineers, even if they don't have a peer that can do it, go over it with a shot fire, go over it with a supervisor, go over it with someone else. Um, even if you're going over with the grad, the process of going over the design with the checklist process, 
um, and reviewing it can make a massive difference. Um, the next one is not to underestimate your loading side of things. Uh, a lot of the time people design it and they assume it's all going to stay consistent. Um, it rains and suddenly their entire blast design is no longer valid. You need to account for that stuff where you can in the blast concept stage and then consider it again when you're doing the design stage. What's going to happen? What could change? What effect is it going to have on a design? Uh, I've been on sites where we had really effective blasts that worked really well previously. It poured with rain. We changed a product to a water resistant product. We end up spending something like 50% more money on that particular shot. And our dig rates were 30% less than they normally were. Uh, if we, once we understood the issues and the time of year and, and the implications of that area, um, the solution wasn't that hard and it wasn't that expensive. We ended up using whole liners in that particular example. Um, we had to get people on the bench and we had to use the resources for it, but the dig rate improved substantially and we allowed us to use Anfo, which is a cheaper product to substantially offset the costs of those additional personnel on the whole liners. So there are other options there. Um, you just need to understand what they are and account for them in the design process when you're making those decisions about loading because it very much affects your um, your design of your drill pattern. Uh, initiation as well is often an afterthought for engineers because they're busy, as I mentioned earlier, but understanding how you're going to fire it, again, good thing to pick up in the concept stage. Understanding how you're going to fire it, the way you're going to fire it, and why you're firing in that direction can make a huge difference to the way you design your pattern, especially if you're looking at varying your burden to spacing ratios, trying to optimise cast, things like that, understanding how you're going to fire it, where you're going to fire it, and what those geotech constraints are um, can be quite effective in um, improving your, your blast results. Uh, next process is validating, and this is one of the things that often gets missed. Um, a lot of the time, sites can understand the problem, they can fix the problem, and then they come through to uh, actually figure out what worked and what didn't, and no one's actually really gone there and had a really good look at, well, did it actually work? And how expensive was it? And is this the best solution or is this a solution? So you've got your domains, you looked at your blast, you've identified where you can improve it. At that point, you need to go back through that post-blast review process and ideally really focus on the section you were trying to improve and understand whether or not you actually fixed the problem. Sometimes you haven't. And I, I don't find it uncommon in the industry, especially if the cause of the problem is poorly understood is for solutions to be implemented and them not work. Um, that may be because the ideal solution is expensive. You may know what works, but you've got a lot of kickback from the operational teams. Whole liners are a classic example. Nobody wants to use them. They're horrible to use. They're expensive and they're operational nightmare. And they're also highly effective depending on what those that particular example and the, and the, and the situation in the field is. Changing to electronic detonators often gets pushed back from operational, from, from management because of the cost and a, and a, and a lack of understanding of the, the positive results. Um, there's, there's multiple examples in the industry, satellite holes for cap rock, multiple points of initiation, issues with ground vibration. Uh, the, the, the variation in, in where you can get that pushback is quite high. If you can prove that you're fixing things, especially if it's incremental, the incremental changes often get less pushback um, rather than large decisions. It's hard for something like changing a whole line of electronics. But if you change it on a small trial shot and people understand it's a trial, it's usually easier to get across the line. And if you can really clearly identify what is improved and track it and actually show metrics for it, it's usually also easy to get the budget to further that process. Um, and understand whether or not the additional cost was actually worth the changes, or if you're better off just throwing money at it and changing the powder factor. Um, the more information you can gather from that process, the better. But the idea of that of that um, process is to, to consolidate any gains you've got, learn from your losses, and make sure you're getting that continuous ongoing improvement. Um, the next point is updating the baseline. So this is you've gone you've gone through the entire process, you've understood what worked and what didn't. And then you're going to go back and you're going to look at those blast domains and have a look at what worked and what didn't and what we're going to do. So at that point, I would, again, go through a checklist process. I'd, again, be looking at those post-blast reviews and making sure you're putting this information in a blast management system or some sort of other system that allows you to find that information later. You want to be able to see every single blast that's been fired over a fairly long period of time and understand those trends. Understanding single data points when you can open up a single fire from the last blast the last blast might have worked well, but the three before it might have been full of water. And if you don't identify that particular issue because you can't see the data because it's too hard to find, or it's in head office and a zip file, which often happens when um, when your folders get full, especially with blast videos, uh, it can, can become a problem to actually understand the history of the blast, especially with rapid turnover of engineers, as we're certainly seeing in the industry currently. Yeah. 
So those blast domains are your baseline, and the blast the base the baseline shouldn't be something that sits there and is a bible and never gets changed because such and such an engineer four years ago said it was the best way of blasting. Four years ago, it probably was. It doesn't mean it's still the best way of blasting. And those blast domains should evolve. They should improve and they should change over time unless your blasts are absolutely optimal. And sometimes they might be, but most of the time they're not. And where they are, things will often change over time. 15 or 20 blasts might work really, really well. And then suddenly there's a small change in the lithology or the explosive manufacturers had to add an extra 10% water to their product to meet a budget and suddenly whatever used to fume produces fume. Things change over time and being able to make sure those baselines are agile and actually can adjust and you've got a process in place to update those over time and understand that the blasting is improving and changing um, is quite important. Um, some sites have their blast domains as a live document. Um, there's something that the engineers can just open up and change whenever they want to. It can work really, really well for small sites. Other sites where you've got lots of engineers working on them and, and quite um, you know, detailed systems, um, especially those larger companies, you may need to make something that's more of a fixed document and go through a formal process to change it monthly or quarterly. Um, I, go, I have concerns with those on a lot of sites because it does potentially... Um, you lose a lot of value potentially if you can't be as agile as you need to be. Um, you want to try and have some sort of system in place to allow you to be agile in your blast design. But even if your blast concepts don't change, specifically the um, sorry the blast domains don't change, the idea is you should be able to use those as a base point and modify them through the concept stage if you can prove where things work last time and then update those blast domains as you've got enough body of data, body of information to through that validation process to prove that uh, it's worth changing that particular um, data point. One of the other things with updating the baseline is to make sure the history is there, make sure people can understand it. So if an engineer comes on in, they look at it and they go, oh, why'd they do that? They've got a burden of spacing ratio of 1.1 to 3. That's crazy. It's a stand-up shot. There might be a really good reason for it, but intellectually and from the history of the engineer who's looking at it, it makes no sense. They might, you might suddenly understand when you start reading the background that the reason it changes because of the way the rock structure sits or the way that you have to fire it because of uh, issues with ground vibration or the particular shovel that digs it was having issues and we did this by accident and it worked really well and this is why. Or they may have totally stuffed up and it may not be meant to be a one to three and people have never picked it up. Like if, if we can understand what's happened with it and why, it's easy to improve things going forward, especially if there's a change in engineers. Um, all things have changed and the ground's changed. The more information you can have in those to help people understand the history of this particular domain and what's changed over time and what direction it's moving in, especially if those changes are incremental, uh, the easier it's going to be. It ends up resulting in you leaving those blast domains as a legacy, which means the next engineer can come in and they've got a progressive, sustainable and continuous process that allows them to improve. That makes everyone look good. So... Generally, as a summary, I've gone over it all. We've looked at um, it's it's a cyclic process. So you want to look at building you want to look at building that baseline. You want those domains. You want to make sure that they're clear and consistent and really really easy for people to use. Uh, they need to be highly highly functional. They need to be. They also need to capture all the data and they need to be as complex as they need to be for the site without being excessive. They need they need to be something that someone can understand. If one domain is fifteen pages of detailed information. That's good if it's if it's there, but you at least need a summary. What do people need to do now and why? The next point is you're implementing your problem, sorry, identifying the problems. That's the post-blast review, post-blast reconciliation stage. It's something that's it's one of the most commonly um, poorly done things on a mine site, especially regarding to when you have learned something where it's actually going to be captured and stored so that you can understand that later. And actually also making sure that the operational team is, is giving you buy-in. You might have the best design in the world, but if you haven't made it operationally feasible or if the same problem continually occurs, if every time you drill a hole and you think it's going to be loaded with ANFO, you always end up with a metre and a half of water on the bottom of the hole and they're dewatering it and putting a water-resistant product in there. Or if every single time you drill in that area, you get two metres of fallback in the holes and people aren't understanding that, so you're trying to increase sub-drill to get rid of tow, that may not be the problem. It might be a... a um, a depth compliance issue when you manage to be looking at the drills, for example. Understanding the causes of those, especially the operational constraints, um, can have a, a level of value to be able to fix those problems and also understand the problems. Been a lot of money spent in the years on not on, of, on trying to fix things with money and explosives um, because of some fundamental issues with the way it was being handled operationally and a 
failure to get that information back. Our modern blast management systems have really helped in that regard because you're getting relatively clear information from the field. But again, it's only as good as the information that's provided. If you're in, if your drill and blast teams are, are using that those um, resources correctly and they're putting all the information and comments on the tablets, great. But if they're not, at least you've got the opportunity when you're talking to the shot fires one on one and looking at the blast in a semi formal meeting. A lot of the time, you'll capture more information than you necessarily will um, through reports only. Um, going through and proposing those solutions, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's where you're wanting to look at those blast concepts, some sort of a higher level. Uh, look at a larger area of blasting. You may need to do those on a shot by shot basis. You might do them on a strip by strip basis in say coal mine, or you might do them as a section of blast masters in a similar blast domain if you're working in a metal mine. Being able to understand and propose um, solutions for those helps you then implement them when you're doing those drill and blast designs, which is where I mentioned earlier, you really wanna be trying to spend the majority of your time if you can, so that the engineers can come up with really high quality, creative design decisions that fix the issues. You might have some complexity and you normally have some level of complexity in the blast. Almost every single blast is gonna be at least a little bit different from the blast before it. So understanding those differences and being able to spend the time to work around them and, and find technical fixes for them um, will a lot of the time alleviate a lot of the issues you're finding in your blasting to make sure you're able to, to do good designs and then peer review those designs, um, either with a senior on site or with peers or even shot for us to help validate those solutions as I mentioned again to make sure that anything you have improved you're capturing you're understanding it and you're being able to capture that value going forwards um, to make sure that you can prove the changes especially if you're needing to justify changes in costs justifying electronic usage on mine sites is amazingly hard to do um, considering the huge body of information we have in the industry over how effective electronic detonators are there's a lot of mine sites that are still heavily resistant to using them. Probably some of the mine sites of the people on this chat today. Um, being able to prove that works and prove that the, the value in it can be highly effective. Um, same thing with hole liners. If you're trying to sell something that's hard and complex and difficult to do and goes against the KPIs of your teams on site, you really need good hard data on that. And you potentially need to be able to have enough hard data that you can raise it up to a high level, high level management to be able to get the support you need to start modifying those KPIs, or at least give some sort of level of relief for giving people a hard time and they're not meeting them. If you've got load rate, load rate restrictions and you have to achieve 200 tonne a day and you can only achieve 150 tonne a day because you're working with whole liners, that needs to be really clearly communicated and it needs to be in schedules and it needs to be understood at a high level. Um, that sort of stuff needs to go all the way up to midterm planning to make sure that it's understood or you need to uh, work around it with manning and, and additional resourcing to, to get around it if it's worth the extra money and understand what those downstream effects are. And then again, update your baselines. Make sure that you've got a new base point and make sure I understand that this whole process is meant to be a cycle. It's meant to be incremental. It's meant to be progressive and it's meant to change over time. You wanna try and improve every single one of your blast domains, ideally every single time. And if that blast domain's fantastic and it's working great, awesome. Keep an eye on it and make sure nothing's changing and make sure that when you're going through, you're identifying the problem and proposing solutions sort of stage in those blast concepts, you're looking out for any changes. You've got really good geology inputs, really good geotechnical inputs. You've got measure well drilling data if it's available. You've got instantaneous degrade data. You're going out and looking out in the field to understand if there's a change. The more information you can get, the more likely it is that you're going to identify a problem before it occurs and you're going to be able to fix the issue. So yeah, I end up going through that a little bit quicker than I expected, but um, um, yeah, got more time now for questions. So is there any time, hopefully it's added some value for you. If there's anything you're doing on your sites as well that you found works better, if you've got things that you can see that you think aren't gonna work, please fire away, always welcome feedback. And I'm very, very interested in, um, in hearing what you all think. So Mark, we do have a question um, that's from Fidel. Hi, Mark, what are your thoughts of including um, in the medium long-term planning this value information? So usually forecasting activities are based on average data of penetration slash loading rates, but not technical variables. Do you think this would be useful? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, of the last two mine sites I've worked at, we've gone through exactly this process. And that's one of the things that can be highly valuable in that blast domain process. If you've got blast domains and you've got them fixed, that point where you want them to be agile and change over time, ideally reasonably quickly, it doesn't mean you can't get 
a fixed point in time and send an update to your midterm team quarterly or annually, which at least gives them a more accurate data point, especially if you're able to divide them up. Um, I've seen them used quite effectively in Spry as, um, as parameter tables based on certain types of material. If you, can, if you can find a way to subdivide your domains up in a way that works well in the scheduling software um, and works in with the rest of the processes. Um, in coal mines, it's usually easier because you've got seams. So you can usually divide them up into seams. Uh, in metal mines, it can be a little bit more complex, but sometimes a lot of the time at that point, you can divide them up using solids and things like that. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of value to be had in that. A lot of the time it can be complex to implement because you normally need to have some level of formula driven process in there. If you've got fixed bench heights, it's not too bad. You can often end up being able to code some sort of fixed burden and spacing in there um, where you've got variations in bench heights, especially in say a coal mine where you might have rapidly um, dipping coal seams, standoffs above and below coal and, and varying bench heights. You might have a bench height that goes from three meters to 40, 40 meters over uh, three blocks in one blast. Things like that can be can add a higher level of complexity to how you need to actually model them in midterm. But it's certainly all doable if you if you do the work in a spreadsheet and and you commit the time to it um, in some sort of process. Like it's I was doing it in the SRF um, three month space uh, regularly um, on the last site I was working at, and it was it was highly effective. Um, the feedback from the teams was was really good. We improved our variation in in um, penetration rates and drilling by something like it was out by about fifty percent a lot of the time. And we reduced that down to somewhere around five to ten percent, which was was quite effective, and the feedback was quite good. Um, and the idea at that point was to then embed it into the Spry software itself to to minimise those calculations and improve the time it took. Anyone else got any anything, or did I actually answer your question? Yeah, Mark, I think you've answered everyone's questions. Um, so look, I think we might wrap it up at this stage. If at any stage you do have any further questions, please feel free to reach out at, um, to us at MEC. In addition, we already have all your registered email addresses, uh, which means that we will um, also be sending through the presentation and also a link to this webinar session. Um, I hope you have a, rest, a great rest of the day. And thank you again, Mark Killip, for your excellent presentation. My absolute pleasure. And also, yeah, very welcome any feedback. If there's anything that you are interested in learning more about or anything specific sessions you'd like to have in regards to drill and blast lunch and learn sessions, um, please let us know.